blew up and <laughs> well, I, I didn't respond to him. I just left it with that. But I, it is so funny because people find something and they think, I, you really have to study this and you have to know what God is saying or you're going to come to entirely the wrong conclusion. But these chiasms, just if you're just, you know, here's how I found the first one, just so you can know. And then in the future, if you're reading the Bible, it may help you to find one because this is how people find them. I was reading, and the first one I found I'll read to you is from the book of Deuteronomy. And it's, um, Moses wants to cross the Jordan, and then down here, Moses must not cross the Jordan. Lord is angry with Moses. Lord is angry with Moses. Lift your eyes to the northeast, west, and south. Lift your eyes to heaven. Example of apostasy, warning of apostasy. So it's, it's building up towards the middle, okay? In the very middle one, it says, call upon him, okay? Anyway, so the way that I happen to found that one is... I don't know, you know, the term lift your eyes, that's not, we never say that in our language. We say, well, look up, you know. But the Bible always says, lift your eyes. And so I said, I just read that a while ago. And it was um, four, yeah, it was a whole chapter earlier, 325 and 422. So a whole chapter earlier, I had read the term lift your eyes. And I thought, well, isn't that funny? He just said lift your eyes about something. And all of a sudden, this chiasm came right into focus just because of the term. So as you're reading, if you see something that you say, I've read this before. That is a key that God has put something in there, a chiasm. Then what you want to do, if you have one and you find it and you lay it out, make sure you go online and see if anybody else has come up with it because you don't want to take somebody else's work, right? But um, uh, this guy that my uh, Greek and Hebrew teacher in college, he was translating the book of Daniel. That was just one of the things he was doing. He was translating it himself. And he said, it's funny. I, I know that I translated this already. And so he went back and he read his work. Sure enough, the entire book of Daniel makes a chiasm, and it is the most beautiful, it is stunningly beautiful. I don't have it here because I don't want without somebody's permission to go printing stuff. But it is stunningly beautiful. The entire book of Acts makes a chiasm. And it also makes what's called parallelism. This happens, this happens. Same thing happening again and again, and it's between Peter and Paul, which tells us another thing. Peter was the apostle to the Gentiles, and they say that uh, Acts 13 to the end of it, yeah, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, all right? And exactly the same thing happens again and again, showing us that God is now working in the Gentile world. And it ends with Paul up in Rome, right? I mean, it, it ends with Paul. It's telling us that the Jews are no longer in the picture that the Gentiles are now the focus of God. But that doesn't mean the Jews are out, and people have made that mistake, and now we're in this, this, this problem with the world where people think that... Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Anyway, so this all goes back, and I didn't mean to divert too far into chiasms, but I get so excited about them that I want people to read them. Is it time to go? No. Oh, okay, good. So all of this has to do with what we are reading, with a man... Blessing the younger over the older. And it also fits another parallel in the Bible, which is the second replacing the first. We've gone through them again and again. Who um, uh, Abel replaced Cain, and then he was killed, so Seth took over. Okay, We have that one. Then we have um, Noah blessing. Uh, he, he cursed his one son, but he put, what's his name, Shem over Japheth. Shem is the middle brother. He put him over Japheth. And then after Noah, we go down to uh, Abraham, was the younger brother of, what's his name, Nahor. Nahor died. Abraham the, becomes the second in the line. And then after Abraham, we have Ishmael being replaced by Isaac. And then after Isaac, we have, um, uh, who is it, Jacob over Esau. Okay, now we have the 12 tribes of Israel. So not one is replacing another, but is it? Reuben is out. We can't have Simeon because he's also a murderer. We can't have Levi because he's a murderer along with, uh, with uh, so who comes in? Judah. All right? So it's not the second replacing the first, but it is still divine election. These people are being passed over. But then we come into here, and who receives the blessing? It's Joseph. Joseph receives the blessing, and then out of Joseph, he blesses the second well, over the first. Hand, well, then God's purposes wouldn't have been affected. There's no mistake in here, none at all. But you see, here we are. We're going to see more of these. Oh, another one I skipped over was Judah having the son, uh, not giving him to him, Ur, and then Onan, the last son, Shelah. He ends up sleeping with his own daughter because she wants to have a child. And the two children, Perez and um, uh, what's the other one? Anyway, Perez is the, uh, the puts his hand out, gets the red, red uh, thing, pulls his hand back in. So he's the firstborn. 
and yet the other one, I'm sorry, not Perez, uh, the first one uh, uh, puts his hand out, then Perez comes out first, even though he's the second born. And that's why he was given the name Perez. So the second replacing the first. And those are actually in the line of Jesus. Okay, and Tamar happens to be mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, along with, as I said, four Gentile women. No Jewish women are ever mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, and yet the Gentiles are. So all of this is pointing, and the Jewish people still don't see it. It is all pointing to the coming Redeemer, and that he has a greater plan than the small little working that they think we are the center of the world, even to this day, when God says, no, I am doing something for all the people of the world. I love all of them. Oh boy, isn't it wonderful? All of that goes back to this teeny little account of this guy crossing his hands and how wonderful it is to read that. So please, wherever we are, go ahead and keep reading and I'll be there in a second. 18, okay. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father, since this is this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. Okay, that I made a mistake. It's not the blessing that he made it in uh, verse 16. This is where he says, Melo Hagoim, a multitude of nations, nations or Gentiles, okay? They will be in the midst of the earth, okay? That's not where he's saying that. What he just said right here, I know my son, but this one will be the fullness of the nations, okay? And so he knew, however, whether God was speaking to him or whether he was just prophesying in some way, the Holy Spirit was in him, he knew to bless the younger over the uh, older. And so you can see Joseph is irritated about this. He's grabbing his old dad's hand and he's saying, no, 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 this isn't right. And he's saying, I know, I know what I'm doing. I'm not a dummy here, you know? I know that you set them up, even though my eyes are dim, I know what you have done, but I am doing something different because he will be the fullness of the Gentiles. Ephraim, right here. Oh, what a great account. What an unbelievable account to come into these type of things in the Bible and to understand that God loves all of us. And this isn't just an arbitrary book about, you know, a story like, and it's not just isolated to a little group of people either. This is for all the people of the world. Thank you, God. Okay, go ahead, please. He blessed them that day, saying, By you, Israel, will pronounce blessings, saying, God may make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Then he grieved from before Manasseh. <clears throat> then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you, and I will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given you, <clears throat> rather than to your brothers, one mountain of slopes, one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Okay, so he's giving a promised piece of land to Joseph, which will be fulfilled at the time of Moses. He's, he's going to um, make sure that it's portioned out properly, and um, or maybe after the time of Moses, but it will be in the blessing, I'm sure. Anyway, um, uh, what was it I was just... He also... Uh, his, Truly the younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude, a fullness of the Gentiles. So he blessed them that day saying, um, by Israel will bless you saying, may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. That is similar to the terminology used in the book of Ruth. Remember in the book of Ruth where it says, may uh, the Lord build up your household just as the Lord build up the household of Judah, who uh, Tamar who bore children for Judah. So when they're pronouncing a blessing, they're saying that, May your house become great. And he is saying that their house will become great. And wow, how great is the house of Ephraim if we look at it from the, the standpoint of the church. Okay, then Israel said to Joseph, I'm dying, I will go back to you. And um, uh, he, he's making sure that he knows. Remember that when uh, Israel was at the south border of Egypt, we did this last week. The what? Oh, he was at the, uh, the south border of Egypt in the land of, remember, Beersheba? And that's where he sacrificed to God and God visited him. And he says that Joseph himself will close your eyes, okay? 
and that God will bring the people of Israel back. And that was the promise that God made to Israel as he was leaving Israel, uh, the land of Israel for the last time. And so now he is telling his own son the same thing. Don't worry. God has got all of this under control and that you will go back to the land. Is it time to go yet or are we okay? 20 yet. Well, let's, seeing so we're at 49, let's go ahead and stop there. And uh, then we get the blessings next week, which is really fun. And, um, uh, oh, I'm going to use... Three and four, three and four in the sermon on one Corinthians five five. So uh, one Corinthians five, which will be I think at the end of August or maybe early September. I've already got that in there. So anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit. But what fun, man! I I got to tell you what I get so excited when I see these patterns and parallels in there, and the 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 greatness of what God has done. It's just simply. And as I said, you can look at this, this here for example. There is no way, there is no way that this could be anything except divinely inspired. Yeah. No way. First off, nobody knew this existed until 23 November of 2007, right? I, nobody in history has ever found this chiasm until that day. It had been in there from the time of when Hosea wrote it, which was probably about um, four or 500 BC. Okay, so it had been there for about 2,500 years. Nobody had even known that. But Paul is quoting this same concept in the New Testament, right? And it all leads back to what we read just now. So you see, there's no way that this could have been pre-planned by anybody except God. Right? It couldn't be like, well, we're going to make this story up and we're going to start throwing stuff in here. It had to be something that was divinely inspired. That is what makes this book so wonderfully great and why Bible study is so, it, it, it's so great. I mean, you think about some of the Bible studies you go to in the world and people talk about, well, how does this make you feel? And, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't help with anything. Yeah, it's just, it's like going to a psychologist. But when you understand something like this, and I'm not saying this has anything to do with me because I admitted that I found this and that I couldn't find it again. This is the Lord working, just showing us things. It shows you that He is completely in control and this is why we come to Bible studies is to, to find these things out. And man, the best thing in the world for me, and I laugh when I look at these things and I will be talking and somebody will say something that I had never thought of and I'm like, oh, you know, and we're having this conversation and I think, I'm so glad to know that because we're in Bible study. I had no idea about it until like Mary or somebody says something or you. And I'm like, it's just wonderful. The Bible is so great. So, and here I came in here. I was so tired. Now I'm all excited again. Uh, all right. Somebody, who wants to close us in prayer today?